Well, good morning, family. Uh, what an incredible weekend we had last weekend. I want to say thanks to our incredible staff, our volunteers, our deacon ministry, and just everybody that participated in your praying and your giving that makes the events that we experienced together as a church family this past week so incredible. To see over 200 people uh, dedicate or rededicate their life to Christ, to see 60-plus children uh, give their life to Jesus. These are lives that will be changed for eternity and forever. And all of us share in that, and we can rejoice in the good work that the Lord is doing from uh, Palm Sunday through Good Friday and our Easter services with our family day and all the ministry that took place. We had over 15,000 people those two weekends and all the events combined, the attendance together, that we had the privilege of serving and ministering in one way or the other. Isn't that cool? <laughs> Praise God. So, uh, so thank you, thank you, thank you. Uh, we're continuing our study in the book of Nehemiah, and we're going uh, chapter by chapter, verse by verse, and, and every weekend we're in a whole new section. And uh, we're in the fourth chapter. We're going to finish up, wrap up the fourth chapter today, Lord willing. So if I speak louder and faster and you listen uh, good, we're, we're going to get through it. Uh, we're excited about this. You know, here at Trinity, we believe in opening up ancient truth, the Word of God, and, and, and having practical, practical application of that ancient truth in our lives. Uh, here at Trinity, we want to be an intersection where biblical accuracy and cultural relevancy meet together. I'll say that again. Here at Trinity, we want to be an intersection where biblical accuracy and cultural relevance meet together. I will say some things at times that may sound controversial simply because the further we as a society and as a nation get away, and even as, as churches get away from the teaching of Scripture, the more radical some of the things that Scripture says will sound in our ears. So when I do get to places in a message that sound like foreign language, please bear with me. I'll try to give you also the gift of interpretation of what I'm trying to say. Uh, today's message is not for the faint of heart. Uh, normally, this would not be a post-Easter message, okay? So I'm just warning you uh, in advance. Uh, let's get right into it. Father, we thank you for Nehemiah, the teaching for how you're going to use it in our lives today. We pray and ask your blessing now in the name that's above every name, the most important name, the name of Jesus. And everybody said. All right, here's the breakdown of Nehemiah, chapter 1. One whole chapter is dedicated to Nehemiah's personal reaction to the news of, of, of what he heard about the state that his, uh, his old city of Jerusalem, the city of his forefathers, was in. So a whole chapter was dedicated to that and how he processed that. The second chapter of Nehemiah is really a whole chapter dedicated to uh, Nehemiah going before King Artaxerxes, his boss, basically, the king, and asking permission and favor to go back uh, to initiate this great project. Chapter 3 is really uh, him rebuilding the walls, beginning to start the project, rebuilding the walls and, and reviving the burnt gates. And we spent four or five weeks just in the third chapter alone because there was so much in that third chapter. But here's what's cool, okay? Chapters 4, 5, and 6 of Nehemiah, those three chapters are dedicated to the opposition that Nehemiah faced in rebuilding this, these walls and in the project that God had given to him. So what's the big takeaway uh, over the next several weeks as we study chapters 4, 5, and 6? We're going to finish up in chapter 4, as I mentioned a moment ago. Here's the big takeaway. In life, you have to not only build, but you have to battle. Because what you build, the enemy wants to come and take it away. So we're all building something. We're building godly marriages, godly families, a godly life. We're building a life of integrity. But we have to also know that we're in a spiritual battle. Because the enemy comes and he wants to get us off our wall of what God has us assigned to in what we are building for the glory of God. So we're all building and we're all battling something. We all have things in our life that we are battling. And here's why it's a battle, because the world we live in is hostile to us as, as Christ followers. You know, the Bible does say that we're aliens, okay? Uh, the Bible does say that we are foreigners. We're not of this world, but we're in this world. Our citizenship is in heaven, right, where we eagerly await the return of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. So we, we are basically passing through this life. And so you are a peculiar people. The Bible calls Christians that are totally sold out and devoted to Jesus somewhat peculiar. The world looks at you and they just can't quite figure you out yet, all right? So uh, what we don't understand, what we don't like, we label, we stereotype, we attack, we try to marginalize. That's always going to happen, comes with the territory. As Christians, we're okay with that. Still doesn't change what our mission is. We're salt and we're light. Salt retards corruption, light exposes darkness. And when you are at your best, uh, retarding corruption and, and exposing the darkness, the world's going to get upset with that. They're not always going to have friendly responses to that. Why? Because 
the world we live in is hostile. It's hostile to what you believe. It's hostile to what, how you want to live. It's hostile to the, the biblical truths that you want to live out in your life. The world we live in is hostile to your beliefs, your values, your hopes, your spiritual goals, and your dreams. I saw a, a movie trailer for a movie coming out with Will Smith and his son, Jaden Smith. Uh, it's called After Earth. And in the, in the trailer, uh, there's this dialogue that the father was having with his son. I thought, this is almost biblical. This is so cool. He said, son, this is not training. This is a class one quarantine planet. The threats we will be facing are real. Everything on this planet has evolved to kill humans. Every single decision we make will be life or death. But if we're going to survive, this you must realize that fear is not real. It's a product of thoughts you create. Now, don't, get, don't misunderstand me. Danger is very real, but fear is a choice. And I thought, I can hear God the Father say that to me in Scripture, that we live in a hostile world. Everything in this world is geared because the enemy, who is the, the little G God of this world, 2 Corinthians 4, 4, he comes to steal, kill, and destroy. That's his MO. Jesus said in John 10, 10, the devil's MO is to come, steal, kill, and destroy from you. So we have to know that we're in a battle and that we are battling. But ultimately, the victory is ours because the battle's not ours. It's the Lord. Amen? And everybody here today, listen. God's not giving you a spirit of fear. The worst thing you have to overcome is fear. Fear that you're not going to make it. Fear that you're not going to overcome. Fear that you're not going to be able to withstand. Fear that you're not going to be able to get through what you might be going through. Because all of us are battling something. Uh, some, some people are, are, are battling in their marriage to have a, a good godly marriage. Some people are battling within their family because the, the enemy's trying to, try, trying to hurt your family. Uh, all of us have a battle. Uh, this past week, I was battling a head cold. You know, I finished the Easter services. I'm like, yeah, it was awesome. I woke up Wednesday and I'm like, oh, I don't feel good. So uh, you don't know what you're going to get this morning. I'm, I'm, I'm ODing on uh, Alka-Seltzer Plus all week. So plop, plop, fizz, fizz. Uh, you don't know what you're going to get today in the message. Uh, but that's all the stuff that I'm on. Uh, thankfully to the Lord, he's healing me. So bear with me. I have my Kleenex with me. If I need to use it, I will use it. Uh, so that's what you're going to get. So be, be with me. Pray for me. But we're all battling something. Some people are, are battling to keep their integrity intact. Some people are battling grief or battling depression, battling fear, battling uh, self-doubt. Some people are battling pride or greed, whatever it might be. We're all battling something. Some of you are battling to keep your business afloat, to keep your wits about you, to keep your integrity in check. And guess what? It's never been hard because this hostile world that we live in, everything in this world is geared towards and fixed, not in your favor, but against you. That's why the Bible says, greater is he that's in you than he that is in the world. And it's never been more difficult. I had a guy that walked up to me, always appreciate when I'm out and about meeting people and inter people introducing themselves to me that may attend Trinity. And this guy walked up to me and said, you're the pastor of Trinity? I said, yes. He said, I was, uh, I was in service uh, a while back and you preached a powerful message and we had uh, some small talk. And he said, you know what? I'm battling pornography in my life. And, and I didn't judge him in any way. And I said, you know what, man? I said, there's freedom in Christ. I said, uh, man, as a church, you want to help me? I said, are, are you attending regularly? He said, no, nah, no. I said, there you go, bro. So I'm not trying to tend to condemn you anyway, but there you go. Uh, you know, more pornography, less church, more church, less pornography. I mean, this battle is a spiritual battle. You can't fight this battle on your own. You need a good church around. You need godly men around your life. You need to be accountable. You need to be a part, a part of our men's groups. You need to know that you can't beat this alone, but you can beat this with godly people in your life. He's like, yeah, I know. I know. And it's like, were you yelling at him? I, I started to, yes, in love. Because that's what I get paid to do. I get paid to yell at people. The Bible says uh, that by preaching, some are saved. By the foolishness of preaching, some are saved. Now, you know, uh, I, I, like, uh, I like MMA. I like UFC. I like boxing. When I was a little kid, I grew up watching boxing. Now I watch uh, MMA. And, and, and here's what I know. You know, Paul used the analogy of wrestling. He said, we wrestle not against flesh and blood. He also used the analogy of boxing. So, you know, don't condemn me if you don't agree with uh, these, these violent sports. But anyway, um, you know, when a guy's in a cage with an opponent, you know what his corner man's doing the whole time he's in that cage? He's yelling at him. Don't give up. Don't quit. You know, they'll throw a punch. Throw, throw, throw this. Flip him. Get up. Do, do your best. And then when he gets back to, you know, to the corner, uh, you know, during the, uh, you know, when the round ends, what's the guy doing? He's, he's yelling at him. Come on. You can do this. You, know, you got to go back in there. You're losing the round. He tells him the truth. And what we need is you need somebody in your life at least once a week that yells at you in love. 
Don't give up. Don't quit. Don't stop. Don't lose your integrity. Don't, don't, don't go to that website. Don't go to that establishment. Don't go to that old way of living. Don't go back into that old way of thinking. God has something better for you. God has a better plan for you. God is for you, and he's not against you. He's begun a good work in you, and he's going to complete it in Jesus' name. So I told the guy, so you're going to get in church more frequently. Come on, let's do it. I said, let's do it to the guy. I said, man up, man up, man up. This is your moment. This is your moment to seize what God has for you and, and, and make sure that God wins and the devil doesn't. And so uh, I hope he's here. I love you in Jesus' name. All right. So Nehemiah has battles, and he gives us strategies for winning these battles. And, and listen, there are external battles and internal battles. There are enemies from without and enemies from within. There are physical battles and there are spiritual battles. We all have a battle. Look at Nehemiah chapter 4, verse 10. It says, then the people of Judah began to complain. See, no sooner do you get uh, uh, the new pastor comes into town and, and, he, and he starts a new building project and everybody's happy and, and you have that honeymoon time, you know. Now they're, they're thick in the work of it, right? Opposition is beginning to show up. And now the people are mad at the pastor. And they're starting to do what people do. They're starting to complain. Everybody say complain. And here's what their complaint was. The workers are getting tired. Hey, let's just stop there. How many of you sometimes you just get tired? I mean, life just wears on you after a while, doesn't it? I mean, you get tired, you get, you know, those of you that are students, you get tired of getting up and going to school and studying and finals and tests and will this ever end and, and, and you know, and then, then, you, then you get a job and, and, and you get tired of going to work and having to produce and, and you know, it's just, you know, sometimes we just get tired. So we, we, don't, we don't condemn these workers. They were working hard and they were getting tired and sometimes we get weary and they went on to say, and there's so much rubble to be moved. We will never be able to build the wall by ourselves. Whoa, whoa, stop, wait a minute. Be careful when you begin to use the word never, okay? Because that's a word that uh, God doesn't understand, never. Because with God, all things are possible, right? Uh, in, in our own strength, in our own ability, probably not, right? But Scripture says, not by power, not by might, but by my spirit, says the Lord. Where your strength runs out, God's strength kicks in. I'll say that again. Where your strength and my strength runs out, God's strength kicks in. The Bible says, let the weak say, I am strong. And some of you are thinking, man, he needs more Alka-Seltzer every weekend. Huh? <laughs> plop, plop, fizz, fizz. Come on, pastor, preach it. I think I'm doing better preaching than you are listening. All right, here we go. So the people were complaining. Listen, when you become discouraged, distracted, disgruntled, despondent, that will always lead to defeat. So this is a leadership crisis. This is a moment for the leader to show up. How does Nehemiah respond to not only the threat from without, but now the threat from within? Because people are getting discouraged and despondent, and they're beginning to talk like they're defeated, and that could kill the project dead on arrival. Now, Nehemiah could have done this, but le leaders, listen, leaders don't have the luxury of doing this. Nehemiah could have said, you know what? I'm tired. Of, I'm tired, too. I'm tired of you complaining. I'm tired of you whining. I'm tired of y'all showing up late for work. So you know what? We got this wall halfway. Let's just, let's just stop here. I had it better back in Persia anyway. I don't know about any of you, but I was a former cupbearer to the king. So let's just end it right here and uh, leave it to our children or our children's children, and I'll go back to Persia, and you go back to your way of life, and we'll just say we give it our best shot, but we came up short. How many know leaders don't have that luxury to, to quit? Not halfway through, not when the project's halfway done, right? How do we know that we can't quit on our country? We can't quit on our faith. We can't quit on our church. How do we know we can't say, yeah, the problems we're facing as Americans, let's leave it to our children. Let's leave it to our grandchildren. Absolutely not. These are problems we must face. These are problems in which we must rise to the occasions, and these are problems that we must see God by his mercy and his grace as a revival hits America once again, sees renewal in this nation one more time. We can't quit. We can't just leave it for somebody else. Hey, what if Martin Luther in 1521, the great reformer, he stood before the holy Roman emperor, Charles V, at the Diet of Worms. And the Diet of Worms was not a weight loss support group, my friend, okay? It was an official meeting in which he was to recant the things he was preaching and writing about and teaching. And he stood there, the whole known world of religious power against him. And he said this. It's where he made his famous here I stand speech. 
And he said, I consider myself convicted by the testimony of Holy Scripture, which is my basis. My conscience is captive to the Word of God. Thus, I cannot and will not recant. Because acting against one's conscience is neither safe nor sound. So here I stand, here I shall die. So help me God, amen. Dude, how many know that that leader rose up in his hour of crisis and he didn't flinch in the face of opposition? He didn't turn tail and, and run away. Would have been real easy for Martin Luther to say, oh, I didn't know you all were going to get so upset about this. Hey, I, I'm sorry. Look, I take it all back, and uh, I'll do whatever you want me to do. Well, the world wouldn't have changed. Thank God, hundreds of years later, another man stood up, and he had his famous speech. It wasn't here I stand, but I have a dream. Are you with me? Are you with me, church? Uh, what if our founding fathers had the attitude of, okay, it's getting too tough. You know, uh, we're, we're fighting for independence, you know, that we could be a free uh, and sovereign nation so that, uh, you know, in 2013, teenagers could have iPhones, Wi-Fi, uh, text messaging, and Facebook. No. Uh, what if they would have said in the middle of the fight for our independence, they said, this is way too much. We didn't know the British were going to react this way. We thought they were just going to lay down and let us have our freedom. We're done. What if George Washington... In that grueling winter of 1777 and 1778 at Valley Forge, what if he looked at the state and the condition that his army was in, the, the, the threat from the enemy from without, the hunger, the starvation, the privation, and what if George Washington, our founding father, said, listen, I didn't sign up for this, guys. This is getting way too costly. It's costing me personally. I'm out of here. I'm going to go back to Mount Vernon, and I'm going to grow, continue to grow my farm. How many know we wouldn't be here in the America that we know today if he would not have shown up, if he would have quit, if he would have given up? How many know that leaders don't have that luxury? What if the World War II uh, generation, uh, what if in the middle of, of the World War II war, what if they said, wait, this is way, way, way too costly. I mean, the sacrifice is too great. Let's just give Hitler and uh, Hiohito, the emperor of Japan, let's just give them what they want. It's just, this is, the sacrifice is just too great. What if William Wilberforce, in his fight against slavery, what if he would have said, you know what, this is taking its toll on me personally, on my family life, and my family time. I, I just think, i got to give up on this cause. Slavery never would have been ended. What am I saying? Leaders don't have the luxury to retreat. Leaders don't have the luxury to surrender. I love this part uh, of the, the book of Nehemiah because Nehemiah becomes the Old Testament Leonidas of Jerusalem right? Spartans never retreat. Spartans never surrender. This is Spartans' law. I'm like, cool. Men of God never retreat. Men of God never surrender. Men of God pledge allegiance to Jesus. Men of God say, here I stand and here I shall die. My conscience is captive to the word of God, so help me, God. And they don't change for the world. They expect the world to change for them. <laughs> Woo! Wow. Nose white break. You know when the going gets tough? The weak give up. Remember the children of Israel in the, in the wilderness? First generation liberated from slavery. First generation liberated from bondage. But slavery and the concept and the mentality of save slavery, of being in bondage, was so embedded in them, God couldn't get it out of them even after a 40-year trek in the wilderness. Not one of those individuals, those first generation men and women delivered from bondage and slavery could enter into the promised land. It took their children and grandchildren they were the only ones that were able to enter in. Why? When the going got tough, what did they want to do? They wanted to go back to where? To Egypt. You know what the devil's intent is for you and me? He wants you to get discouraged. He wants you to become despondent. He wants you to become disillusioned. He wants you to feel as though you're defeated, that the rubble is too much, the problems are too great, they're too insurmountable, we're never going to make it, we're never going to finish it, we're never going to get through it, we're never going to get over to the other side. He wants you to say, that's right, and he wants you to quit, and he wants you to quit so that you can go back. I mean, you know we all have a back. I'm not talking about this back. I'm talking about a past that we can go back to. And the devil is working right now over time to get every single one of you to stop, get off the wall that he's assigned, that God has assigned you to. He wants you to get discouraged and tired and start mumbling and grumbling and complaining because the rubble is just too much. For you, it is. For me, it might be. For us, it might be. But for God, it never is. 
Are you listening to me, church? For God, it never is. True story, true story. A uh, person in our church, a sister, uh, her sister and their marriage 25 years ago faced a, a crisis. She discovered her husband had committed adultery on her. But here's what the husband did. He genuinely repented before God. You see, some of the people around her at that time said there's too much rubble. This is wait, This is your ticket out of this relationship. This is your ticket out. The Bible even says, you know, for this cause, for this reason. But she believed that God wanted her to forgive and that God, she believed that God could do a miracle and restore that marriage. Let me tell you something. 25 years later, three kids later, they have never been more in love. They have never been happier. The rubble was not too much uh, uh, for the Lord to remove. She turned it over to the Lord. He, he, he turned his heart to God. He became accountable to other godly men. And God has restored their family. And God has restored their marriage. God has won in that family. And the devil has lost. And that's what I'm talking about today, church. Look at verse 11. Meanwhile, our enemies were saying, before they know what's happening, we will swoop down on them and kill them and end their work. You see, that's just like the devil, isn't it? He threatens. He wants to come in. Jesus said he comes for three reasons, steal, kill, destroy, John 10, 10. Uh, he, he, he's, after, he's after you completely. Why? Because he, he wants to end your work. All of us come into this world with a work, a calling, a purpose. Sometimes it takes a while for us to discover what that purpose is, what that calling is, what that work is. But ultimately, it's the work that God gave to Abraham, and he, he felled, and, and then it got renewed. And then it was the work that Abel had, and it was cut short because his brother Cain killed him. And it was the work that God gave to Seth, and it was the work that God gave to Abraham, and then the work that God gave to Isaac, and then the work that God gave to Jacob, and then the work that God gave to Nehemiah, and the work that God gave to Esther, and, and the work that God gave to, to Isaiah, and Jeremiah, and Daniel, and Ezekiel, and and all the prophets, and it was the same work that God gave to John the Baptist and the work that Jesus came and personified and, and the work that he finished on the cross and, and then the work that he gave to Peter, James, and John and his disciples and then the work that he gave to the Apostle Paul and, and the work that was given to previous generations of believers that came before us and now the torch has been, ta has been passed to this generation and now all of us have been assigned that work to make the name of Christ famous in our generation, to advance the cause of Jesus Christ in our generation, to be the salt that retards corruption and to be the light that exposes darkness in our generation. That's the work that the enemy wants to keep you from, my friend. He wants us to be discouraged. This was a real threat from the Kim Jong-un of Samaria of Nehemiah's day, bellowing threats of a complete and total annihilation. But the, but the leader, Nehemiah, rose up. Look at verse 12. The Jews who lived near the enemy came and told us, Say this uh, with me, again and again. Say that with me, again and again. Say it again, again and again. That's just like the devil. He doesn't come one, at one time with his lies in your life and my life. He comes again and again and again and again. And how is the enemy coming against you? Again, the, the King James translation says ten times over. With these threats, with these lies, with the distortion. It goes on to say, they will come from all directions and attack us. The enemy wants to make you feel as though you're isolated, that you're all alone, that he's going to come at you at all directions and you're going to be defeated. But my Bible says when the enemy comes at you in one direction, he shall flee in seven different directions. My Bible says submit yourself to God, resist the devil, and he will flee from your life. The battle is not yours. The battle is the Lord's, and he will fight on your behalf. Isn't that good news today, church family? That uh, no matter what the devil, uh, the threats that he tries to level against us, we will not be moved. You know the fact that the enemy's attacking you? You know what it's a sign of? It's a sign that you are a legitimate threat to him, or else he would be leaving you alone. You see young people that battle depression and the devil tempts them to take their lives. Why? He wants you out of the race. He wants you, before you ever really fully discover the work and the plan and the purpose that God has for your life, he wants to cut it short, my friend. And it is proof that you are a prize trophy of the Lord and he has something special for your life. You need to let the devil know where he can go. In Jesus' name in your life. That's right. So how does Nehemiah respond? So I placed armed guards. Are you kidding me? 
Now, Nehemiah wasn't a general, you know, he wasn't a military strategist. He was a former cupbearer, but he had God's wisdom and he had common sense. And he had the direction of God in his life. So here's how he responded to the real physical threat. I placed armed guards behind the lowest parts of the wall in the exposed areas. Everybody say exposed areas. The Bible says give no foothold to the devil, Ephesians chapter 4. Sometimes we can have exposed areas in our life, in our families, in our marriage, in our integrity, and God wants to illuminate those areas and he wants us to close the gaps in our lives. He wants us to defend the exposed areas. So I stationed the people to stand guard by families and armed them. Everybody say arm them. Like I said, Nehemiah would be a good American. He would have believed in the Second Amendment. And arm them with swords, spears, and bows. Well, Pastor Carl, wasn't Nehemiah a spiritual man? Shouldn't he have just prayed and trusted the Lord? Absolutely. Pray, trust the Lord, praise the Lord, and pass the ammunition, please. Okay? We have exposed areas as a nation. We realize that on 9-11, right? So we've, we've done what we can. Sometimes we overdo and underdo, whatever. But we do what we can to protect innocence. We have exposed areas. I'm 50 years of age. I've never seen our country in the state that it's in. I've never seen a greater threat than we have both from without and from within as we do today. I'm quite alarmed. And I feel that the Lord, he woke me up at 4 this morning. He's been talking to me. He's, he's been in my face. The Lord's been in my face. I'm sure he's been in a lot of your faces too, but he's been in my face. And he's saying, Carl, take your preaching to a whole new level. He said, take your preaching to a whole new level. Do you have the courage to say the things that I'm going to place in your heart that I want you to say? I'm like, hey, listen, dude, I work for you, right? I work for you, Jesus. Uh, I'm just a mailman, so yeah, whatever message you give me, I will deliver it. It's not my fault. It's, don't blame me. Don't get mad at me. Don't send me emails. Send your email to Christ at trinitytoday.com, okay? <laughs> so we have exposed areas. We have exposed areas in our schools. Why? Because you have these cowards, these demon-possessed they're not mentally ill, they're demon-possessed individuals who are the greatest cowards among us, who load themselves up with body armor, get weapons, and go into these exposed areas, schools, and slaughter innocent children. Are you kidding me? They show up at movie theaters, and they mow down innocent people who are there to simply enjoy their freedoms and get a little bit of entertainment, and these cowards show up full body armor to shoot innocent people. You know what they need to do? They need to join the army, get issued a real gun, and go fight in a real war and kill the real enemy. Oh, but no, no, no. Bullets would be fired back at these cowards, and they can't handle that, right? Right? That's what I'm talking about. You know what I'd like to do? I'd like to get these guys alone in a padded cell, just me and them and Jesus. And I would like to go Old Testament on them. And I'd like to beat the devil out of them so that I could pray for them to surrender their life to Jesus and then bring them to Texas and Hang them high. <laughs> You're like, wow, I can't believe you said that. Aren't you a pastor? That's not very Christian. It's Old Testament Christianity, okay? Amen. We start there, and then we always end with the New Testament with grace. <laughs> you know, the other thing, these cowards don't try this in Texas. They know better. Go into a Texas church and try to shoot people? <laughs> yeah, hey, people in Texas bring their guns and their Bibles to church. I'm not advocating. I'm just simply saying, <laughs> I don't want to know either. No, I don't want to know. I just, I'm just... Playing dumb, okay? Cowards. Exposed areas. Now we have to have armed, armed guards in our schools. Because it's not even safe for our children to go and learn. That's the state that we're in. So we respond, even as Nehemiah, as a leader, responded uh, accordingly. And notice what he said. Stick, guard your families. Stand with your families. Our family's under attack severely in our nation right now. And I know families are hurting here. We love you. We don't judge you. We don't condemn you. There's hope. There's grace. There's mercy. There's a way out. There's hope. There's help. There's healing. But we need, we need to stand with our families. Now more than ever, we don't need men checking out. We don't need women checking out. Now more than ever, we need to stand together, not only in our, our physical families, but in our spiritual family, the family of God. We need to stick together. We need to stand together. We can't go at it alone. The dangers we face are real. But fear is a choice, and we are not to fear. And we're to have weapons, swords, spears, and bows. What's the sword? God's word. What are the spears, personalized promises of Scripture in our life that we're using against the enemy? 
Uh, what are the bows and the arrows? P prayer and praise. These are the weapons of our warfare that are not carnal, but are mighty through God for the pulling down of strongholds. Okay, look at verse 14. Then as I looked over the situation, I called together the nobles and the rest of the people and said to them, I want you to say this with me out loud. It ends with an exclamation mark, so we got to say it with gusto. Here we go. Don't be afraid of the enemy. Let's say that again. I like that. Don't be afraid of the enemy. Let's finish reading. Remember the Lord who is great and glorious and fight for your brothers, your sons, your daughters, your wives, your homes. Woo, come on, Nehemiah. He's having his William Wallace moment. Braveheart. We will not surrender. Our wives, our sons, our daughters, our lands, our homes, we will fight this day. Yes, we might die, but we will die for a cause. Better to die for freedom than to live as a slave. <laughs> Come on, man, that's what I'm talking about. Strength and honor. That's, that's what we need. We need more men talking like men, preaching to men like men. Ladies, we had a lady preaching like a lady to ladies yesterday. Today, we have a man preaching to men like men. And all the ladies said, amen. We want more men, right? We need our men. We need our men back in America. Get rid of your caprice pants and your flip-flops. Find some Wrangler jeans and boots, please. Bring back the Marlboro man, even though I'm against smoking. Something about a cowboy on a horse with a cigarette sticking out of his mouth. <laughs> We've gone from the Marlboro man to the Metro man. <laughs> but now I'm running out of time, and I don't know how I got off on that. <laughs> plop, plop, fizz, fizz. <laughs> Blame it on Alka-Seltzer. <laughs> don't be afraid. I looked that up in the Bible. The word fear, feared, fearing, fearful, afraid in the New King James translation of the Bible appears 662 times. I'm like, are you kidding, God? 662? There's got to be four more places. I want 666. Could you imagine the fear? And it's all this derivative showed up 666 times in the Bible. You would know beyond a shadow of a doubt that fear comes from the devil. Don't be afraid. Don't be afraid. Don't be afraid. Because God will fight your battles for you. So many fearful preachers. So many fearful televangelists, so many fearful pastors, and I don't want to be one of them, okay? So many fearful Christians, well, we wouldn't want to say anything to offend anybody. We just want to go along and get along and be nice and happy with everybody. Jesus is so wonderful. <laughs> Never mind the Titanic is in an iceberg and it's sinking. It's all okay. Are you kidding me? This past week in the news, Howard Schultz, CEO of Starbucks. The dude has intestinal fortitude. He stood, he, stood, he stood before his investors and he said, you know what? There are some things more important than profit and money, such as principle. Now, I cannot disagree more profoundly with him in his position on same-sex marriage. Because I'm a Christ follower. And my allegiance is to God above everything and anything else. And my conscience is captive to the Word of God. Here I stand, here I shall die, so help me God. Okay? But Howard Schultz, Schultz stood up. He had the courage, the intestinal fortitude to do what most preachers can't do in this country today. He said, you know, there are some things more important than profit, such as our principle that we stand on for equality for same-sex couples. This is what we believe as a company. And if you don't like it, you don't like your 38 or 32% return on your investment, you can take it someplace else. I'm like, dude, I don't agree with you, but I totally respect you. Because what if some preacher stood up and says, you know what? There are some things more important than offerings. Not very many things, but there are some things more important than offerings. <laughs> you want the truth, don't you? There are some things more important than offerings. There are some things more important than growing attendance. Principle. The living, abiding, eternal truth of God's Word. We are captive to the Word of God. Yes. Come on, church. Amen. Right? Here I stand, here I shall die, so help me God, so help us God. America's in the fight for her life. I'm going to speak a foreign language now, I will try to help interpret it. Nations don't embrace homosexuality on their 
way up. They always embrace it. On the, are we against homosexuality? No. No, I've had homosexual friends. I have, in my, my former church, I was involved in singles ministry. I had two guys that were battling homosexuality. I loved them with the love of Jesus, and I encouraged them, and I stood with them, and they had moral failures, and I said, don't give up. God's not going to give up on you. We can beat this thing together. We can do this. God can help you. Some of you have family members, well, pretty much all of us do, that have family members who are struggling with homosexuality. Well, Pastor Carl, don't two men have the right to love? Don't two women have the right to love? Yes, all humans have the right to love God first. Amen. And when you love God with all your heart, you will love the things that God loves. You will hate the things that God hates. And that includes homosexuality. That includes yeah. adultery. That includes idolatry. That includes drunkenness. That includes drug addiction. That includes every and any sin that comes into a person's life to steal, to kill, and destroy. But Jesus said, I've come that you might have life, that you might have it more abundantly, that you might know freedom. And my friend, where the Spirit of the Lord is, there is freedom. And there is wholeness. And there is healing. And there is grace in Jesus Christ. What the world can't control, listen to this quote, it decriminalizes and legalizes, such as pot, drugs, homosexuality. What Christianity can't control, it psychologizes and rationalizes. This is why conversion is necessary to rectify perversion. Conversion is necessary to rectify perversion. What we need is not to legalize immoral behavior. We need to see an outpouring of God's love and grace and Holy Spirit. We need revival to where the hearts of men and women are changed and they come to Jesus and find love and grace at the foot of the cross for everyone who confesses their sins. And we're all sinners and we're all in need of God's love and grace. And all the people said, amen and amen. All right, I got to finish up. When our enemies heard this, we knew of their plans that God had frustrated them we, we all return to our work on the wall. I pray you return to your work on the wall. God will frustrate the schemes of the enemy. We will not let Satan outsmart us, the Apostle Paul said. We are familiar with his, his tactics, and we need to be. We need to be wise. Verse 16, from then on, only half my men worked, while the other half stood guard with spear shields, bows, coats of mail. The leaders stationed themselves behind the people of Judah, verse 17, who were building the wall. The laborers carried on their work with one hand supporting their load and the one hand holding a weapon. I love that. We've got to build and we've got to battle. Some people are so busy battling, they forget to build. Some people are so busy building, they forget that there is a spiritual battle that we must all be engaged in. It takes both. Verse 18, all the builders had a sword belted to their side, the trumpeter stayed with me to sound the alarm. And let's finish, verses 19 through, through 23. Then I explained to the nobles and officials and all the people, the work is very spread out, and we are widely separated from each other along the wall. We cannot be widely separated, church. we got to stand together as a family, the family of God. When you hear the blast of the trumpet, rush to wherever it is sounding, then our God will fight for us. We worked early and late from sunrise to sunset. Half the men were always on guard. I also told everyone living outside the walls to stay in Jerusalem. Please stay in the church. Don't live outside the walls of God's divine protection. Jesus said he would build his church. The gates of hell would not prevail against it. That way, they and their servants could uh, help with guard duty at night and work during the day. During this time, none of us. Not I, nor my relatives, nor my servants, nor the guards who were with me ever took off our clothes. We carried our weapons with us at all times, even when we went for water. Here are the three big takeaways. Let's remove the rubble. Let's restore relationships. Let's continue to resist the rebel. I like alliteration, so that's the best I could do. Let's remove the rubble with God's help. Whatever rubble may be in your life, your family, we can move it together. And in our nation, God's bigger than this. We can see his hand move. Let's restore relationships. Let's be in right relationship with God, with each other, and with our family members the best, to the best of our ability. And then let's continue to resist the enemy. And here's what I want to ask you to do. I'm going to close on this. I'm going to ask you to do three things in this order. I'm going to ask you to love God like you've never loved God before. I'm going to ask you to love your church. This is not your home church. Whatever your home church is, thank you for visiting and being a guest today. Whatever your home church is, if they lift up the name of Jesus and preach the word, love your church. And then number three, 
Uh, love your pastor. Always got to throw that in. This is important. Listen, in that order. Some people love their pastor. They love their pastor so much that if their pastor goes sideways or does something goofy, they like, forget God, forget the church, I'm following my pastor. Let me tell you something. I love my job, but you know, the, the, the elders of this church, I'm under their spiritual recovery. They could fire me tomorrow. Now, don't let them know that. Uh, don't remind them that because I love being your pastor. I love me. But let me tell you something. If, if God forbid, please keep, keep praying for me, God forbid, if I should turn goofy on you, if I should get involved in anything that's immoral, illegal, illicit, commit adultery on my wife, do something silly, crazy, and ridiculous, pray for me, but don't follow me. Love God, love this church, and pray for me. If I come some weekend with some sad sob story, oh, the elders are being so mean to me, so I'm going to leave and I'm going to start a church across, across town. Don't listen to me, don't follow me. Pray for me, love God, love your church, and then love your pastor. I can be wrong, but God will never be wrong. Amen? And our trust is not in man. Our trust is in God and in godly leadership. And all the people said, Amen. And they said, I love you, pastor. And I love you too. But I love God more. And I love this church. And if we'll, if we'll, if we'll do that, we'll see God. No matter what comes our way in the weeks and months and years to come, as a people, we will survive. Every head bowed, every eye closed. Father, thank you for your love and grace, your mercy, for the Holy Spirit speaking to hearts right now, for men and women responding to what the Holy Spirit has, has burdened their heart with in this message. We respond in faith in Jesus' name. Heads bowed, eyes closed. If you're here today and you don't know Jesus is your Lord and Savior, pray this prayer from your heart with your mouth together with the rest of us. Dear God in heaven, I'm a sinner in need of a Savior. There's only one Savior. His name is Jesus. I turn my life over to you, Jesus. I ask you to come into my heart. Be my Lord. Be my Savior. Amen and amen. Can we give the Lord a hand of praise together? <laughs>